Uh, good morning, labrīt, labas rītas, tere homikust, guten morgen, uh, your excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm not the Prime Minister of Latvia, uh, who will uh, provide an opening speech, uh, but uh, unfortunately, due to urgent, urgent state matters, he is uh, not uh, able to deliver his speech uh, in presence, so he kindly provided a uh, recorded speech, what we watch in a minute. But uh, uh, my name is Andrei Sosilios, I'm chairman of the board of TILDE, and uh, on behalf of organizers, I would like to warmly welcome you to this uh, international conference, uh, Language, Technology, and the Future of Europe where uh, experts from Europe, distinguished representatives from European Commission, uh, national government, uh, Baltic countries, researchers, experts, officials, uh, industry representatives uh, will discuss uh, uh, very important topical questions uh, what is the role of national languages in the United Europe? What are challenges what these languages face in the modern world? And what actions are needed to ensure a thriving of our languages for the indefinite future? And this conference is uh, organized by uh, Multilingual Europe uh, Technology Alliance and Tilde Company and European Commission Information Communication Technology uh, Policy Support Program Project, let's MT. And we, is, uh, we are glad to have a global corporate sponsor for this conference, Microsoft Corporation. And we're very glad to have the uh, Ministry of Culture of Latvia as the organizer of the conference. Um, for uh, technical notes, uh, uh, for two uh, conference languages, uh, English and Latvian, and the simultaneous interpretation service is provided, uh, so you can get uh, headphones uh, at the entrance of the conference hall. So. Uh, I would like you know, uh, wish you a very insightful uh, uh, conference day and discussions. And now let's watch uh, uh, opening address by the Prime Minister of Latvia, Mr. Valdis Dombrovskis. Dear participants of the conference, language, technology and the future of Europe. First of all, welcome to Riga, and I hope this conference will bring an excellent opportunity to discuss the issue of uh, language diversity and modern technologies. Diversity of cultures, languages and traditions is one of the Europe's most valuable treasures. It is uh, language and cultural diversity which gives people of Europe their national identities. And uh, it's our <coughs> duty to preserve this uh, cultural diversity and those uh, different identities to the future generations. At the same time, lang language diversity also brings certain challenges. They may be an obstacles for commerce and communication. And there, the role of modern technologies comes in how to help with the modern technologies to overcome those obstacles to commerce and uh, communication. And for relatively small languages like uh, Latvian, uh, it's certainly uh, a challenge to keep up with ever-increasing pace of uh, time and techno technological development. But it's uh, important also if we want to preserve the language, if we want to develop the language, that uh, uh, language speakers of uh, small languages enjoy the same opportunities as speakers of the larger languages. But this uh, diversity of languages can be also an opportunity, and we have seen this in uh, uh, Latvia, that uh, local technology companies have actually become uh, global, have come to the global market with their developed language technologies. And we can use an example, for example, of uh, uh, Tilde, Latvian company, whose uh, language software is on almost every computer uh, 
uh, in Latvia. There is a language shore initiative bringing together Latvian and European experts to deal with language technologies and it's attracting also a great deal of interest of uh, uh, global IT companies. There is also a good cooperation between Microsoft and Latvian experts as regards uh, development of, say, Microsoft Translator system. We are currently uh, working on the new generation of e-government system, which will also be, uh, will be benefiting from language technologies and there are a number of other initiatives. So I wish uh, conference participants a very successful day and I hope you will be able to address and uh, deeply analyze the issues of the role of national languages in United Europe and can, uh, how language technologies can uh, actually help to preserve and develop uh, uh, cultural and language diversity in Europe. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, now uh, I'm honored to give uh, the floor to, uh, for the opening address to the Minister of Culture of Latvia, Ms. Janet Jansen-Grande. Labrīt un labdien visklātasošie. Man liels prieks, ka jūs esat atbraukuši uz Rīgu, uz Latviju, lai piedalītos šī konferencē. Mēs pēdējā gada laikā esam vairāk kārt tikušies ar dažādiem Eiropas kultūras ministriem, lai pārunātu kultūras lomu tautsēmniecībā, ekonomikā. Ko mēs varam palīdzēt, piemēram, mūsu Latvijas ekonomiskajā izrāvienā? Kādu devumu mēs varam dot? Un ļoti bieži šīs sarunas nonāk pie tā, ka īstenībā vienīgā konkurēt spējas atšķirība pasaulē ir kultūra un valoda. Tad, kad mēs nostājamies uz globālās laipas, kopā ar ķīnieti, krievu, angli, igauni. Tad tā lieta, ko mēs esam iemācījušies, matemātika, fizika, tehnoloģija, biznes, geogrāfija, viss ir vienāds. Nu, cik mēs esam bijuši centīgi un cītīgi, un cik mums ir ļāvis, bet tā atšķirība, ar ko mēs atšķiramies pēc savas būtības, ir valoda, un kultūra. Kā mēs esam uzkrājuši sevī slāņu pa slāņiem kultūru? Ko es esmu lasījis? Raini, Ziedoni, Vācieti, klausījies, jāzep Vītolu, Dārziņu, skatījies, Purvīti, Rozentālu, un turpat blākus man stāv ķīniets ar savu konfūciju, un mēs abi esam bagāti caur šo kultūras dimensiju, un kļūstam vēl bagātāki, ja mainamies ar kultūru. Jebkā mūsu dzēnieks Ziedons saka, ka jaunrade ir maksimāla iedziļināšanās saknēs un vienlaicīgi atvērtība pasaulē. Nu, ja tas ir tā, tad uh, ir jādara viss iespējamais, lai mēs būtu pasaulē konkurētspējīgi jātīst valodu un kultūru. Un šeit, protams, es varētu sākt mūsu mīļo latviešu gaudu dziesmu par to, cik mēs esam maz un kā mēs aizbraucam un kā mēs neko nevaram, bet es to nedarīšu. Es teikšu tā, drogi mīļie, mums ir lieliski iespēja, mums jā, mums ir maza valoda, un īstenībā katram pasaules iedzīvotājiem ir liela laime satikties ar kādu latvieti, jo tikai divi miljoni runā latviešu valodā, un tas ir ļoti unikāli un skaisti, Un mēs esam ar to bagāti. Mēs varētu, Andrei Vasīļev, kļūt par līderiem Eiropā mazo valodu attīstībā, jo tā ir mūsu stiprā puse, un vienkārši daram to. Bet kāds oponents teiktu, jā, bet vai jūs varat kļūt par līderiem Eiropā, jums tur varbūt nav tas un tas? Mēs varam, mēs jau esam līderi Eiropā, mums ir vislieliskākā bibliotekas sistēma, 842 bibliotekas, vienotā tīklā, katrā bibliotekā brīvs internets, katrā bibliotekā ir iespējas ieiet pasaulē, attīstīt savu valodu, savas saknes, ieiet globālajā pasaulē. Mēs nākamgad pabeigsim savu unikālo 
Nacionālo biblioteku. 14. gadā Rīgā būs Eiropas kultūras galvaspilsēta, kur mēs varēsim visai Eiropai parādīt savu unikalitāti. 15. gadā mēs būsim Eiropas prezidentūru un atkal varēsim parādīt. Izdomājam, kas ir jādara. Kultūras ministrs ir jūsu priekšā un daram. Paldies! Thank you very much. And uh, the next opening uh, address will be provided by uh, Mr. Harald Salms, who is director of the publications and dissemination uh, directorate uh, at the publication office of the European Commission. Thank you, honorable minister. Uh, guest participants. I'm going to talk a little bit without being an expert, but the theme is, is very interesting, and, and I will try to give you a perspective uh, uh, from a publishing perspective, how uh, the publishing office of the European Union uh, struggles with uh, the need to preserve one of the values of the European Union, which is language and cultural diversity, but with the realities of free market competition, where we are under pressure of time to publish. When, we, when it takes a long time to publish, our customers are not happy. Let me give you a quick overview of uh, exactly what the publications office is. We are, first of all, an inter-institutional office. Uh, our supervisory board is composed of the secretary generals of the seven major institutions of the European Union. So the Parliament, uh, the Council, the Commission, the Court of Justice, uh, the Court of Auditors, uh, the Economic and Social Affairs Committee, and the Committee of the Regions. Uh, the European Central Bank also sits uh, on our board, supervisory board, as an observer. So, but we don't work only for these eight institutions. We work for all of the uh, agencies and bodies of the European Union. More locally here in Riga, you have the recently developed uh, body for European uh, regulation for um, electronic communications. I believe uh, in Vilnius was the recently developed agency for gender equality, for whom actually our services developed, uh, created their logo. And in the very near future, I believe uh, opening in Tallinn, will be uh, the agency for large-scale IT integration in the area of uh, freedom, uh, security, and, and justice. So these small agencies also, we provide publishing services uh, to them. Our core mandate is uh, publishing uh, the daily official journal uh, in all official languages of the European Union. Um, However, we also publish uh, non, and, and the official journal is a mandatory publication, but we also publish non-mandatory general publications. Um, uh, most institutions uh, have a variety of uh, special research reports, uh, maybe simply pure communication uh, publications where they want to try to outreach to EU citizens to explain their policy uh, directives or their policy orientations. Of course, every uh, every institution has a mandatory, in general, a mandatory uh, annual activity report to publish, and these types of publications uh, we also perform. Finally, we have uh, a physical uh, distribution activity. Uh, of course, in the past, publications were essentially, uh, or exclusively, I should say, print. Uh, today, we are moving increasingly, increasingly to an electronic format, but we still have a logistics and physical distribution activity of print publications. But also, we manage uh, four major uh, websites for electronic dissemination. Uh, probably the best known site, which is a very specialized site, maybe not the best known necessarily to the average EU citizen, uh, is the site for free access to European Union law. It's called Eurlex. Uh, uh, it represents all legislative acts since the beginning of the European Union. Uh, the database is uh, nearly five million uh, documents. 
it increases by approximately uh, 1,000 uh, documents per month. Um, most importantly, though, it's a very, uh, for specialists, everyone involved in the legal uh, profession or academics, it's a, uh, a very highly used website with approximately 16 uh, million pages uh, viewed uh, monthly. Uh, linked to the Yearlex, we also have a very interesting site which we believe strongly promotes uh, multilingualism and, and, and multiculturalism and the ability for other cultures to understand each other. It's the gateway which we call NLEX, which is the Yearlex gateway to the national legislation sites of each member state. And the key feature of this site is that we've created a, a search process whereby, uh, for example, a Spaniard going through Yearlex and NLEX in Spanish can do his search in his native language to find certain legislative acts in the Estonian or Latvian or, or Lithuanian national legislative site. He will find the act in the Latvian or Estonian or Lithuanian language, but at least it certainly facilitates and, and speeds the process uh, of the search. Um, a site which is certainly far less known to the general public, but which represents the uh, free dis dissemination of uh, information of non-legal uh, EU information is called EU Bookshop. We have today approximately uh, 180,000 PDFs available uh, on EU Bookshop. Um, all documents are downloadable free of charge regardless of whether the original paper publication was a price publication. Uh, however, in any case, price publications are becoming insignificant as five years ago our supervisory board uh, determined that the mandate of the publications office is to promote the free reuse of information and, and today uh, practically with, a, with a very few exceptions all publications are free of charge even in paper form. Um, unfortunately, unlike the linguistic uh, equality that you see in your lex, uh, general publications which are not mandated by law, are driven by the economic realities of the authors. Uh, so if you look at uh, the EU Bookshop website, uh, over half of the publications are available only in three languages, uh, uh, in approximate equal numbers, English, French, and German. Uh, at the other end of the scale, smaller languages uh, in like uh, Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian, have about 2,000 titles uh, each in, in, both in their languages on this EU Bookshop site. Um, in public procurement, everyone involved in public procurement uh, makes reference to a site called TED, which stands, it's an acronym, Tenders Electronic Daily, and it represents all information of public procurement in the member states, and another site which has a rather well-known brand recognition among uh, a specialized research and scientific community is uh, the Cordis site, which provides uh, information in six languages, uh, uh, English, French, German, Spanish, Italian, and Polish. Um, most importantly, how do we try to uh, solve this apparent paradox? As was mentioned in Mr. Prime Minister's opening speech and Mrs. Minister's uh, speech, uh, language diversity and cultural diversity are one of the key values of the European Union, united through uh, diversity. Uh, but, on the, but on the other hand, as explained in the conference uh, opening uh, description, it is a real economic barrier to the free movement of people, goods, and services. I mentioned the fact that every day I get complaints from my customers, the, the institutions that I've mentioned, the agencies and bodies, can't you publish my publication faster? And the fact that the more languages you have, the longer it takes for the time to publish. So it's a very, very difficult uh, uh, challenge to resolve. We have a number of services uh, that we uh, provide to our authoring institutions. And again, I remind you, if you think of it, we are the next stage in the production chain downstream from the creation of the content. We, the publications office, does not create any content. We receive manuscripts from the institutions and the bodies and the agencies of the European Union. 
Generally, the original manuscript is created in one language. It's then, uh, then the, the institution turns to uh, the uh, translation directorate of the commission, or the parliament has its own translation uh, directorate or department, likewise for the court of justice, to make translations in different languages. When we receive these multilingual uh, translations, we offer proofreading services so that uh, uh, we can ensure that there is consistency in all the various language versions. A major trend that we're seeing today, which is becoming uh, a, a, an increasingly important management question, how do we allocate resources, is that increasingly uh, translations that we receive in English are made by non-native speaking uh, English uh, writers. And we feel that we have to devote more and more time to what is called in the industry true copy editing, whereby maybe the content in English is, expresses the right meaning, but it's not written in the way a true native speaker, uh, English speaker would, would speak. And so we have to spend a lot of time, in fact, rewriting the content. Another service that we provide is synopticism. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the word, it simply means the ability to make sure a word or a sentence is on the same page in each linguistic version. This is a very specialized requirement, but it's a very important requirement for the Court of Justice case law, for example, to make it easier to reference case law in different language versions. Uh, uh, the Court of Justice wants to have synopticism. It's also used for the official journal with legislative acts in different language versions. It does also uh, this type of publication with synoptism makes uh, useful input for machine translation tools. We also have created uh, an interinstitutional style guide. It's basically uh, our contribution to trying to create a common look and feel or image of all European Union publications, regardless of whether the source is the Commission, the, the Council, the Parliament, etc. So again, we have a style guide which uh, we try to uh, uh, make sure that all authors or all, all content creators respect and use. Very importantly is a tool which is called Eurovoc. And we manage, uh, we created and manage this tool uh, on behalf uh, for, for our own uses, but also uh, uh, the European Parliament and many national and regional parliaments use it. And what it is, is a, a tool available in 23 languages, and we're developing, extending it to Croatian and Serbian as well. And it's a multilingual, multidisciplinary uh, thesaurus. Uh, it's based on uh, the technical recommendations of the World Wide Web Consortium, and it really utilizes the latest trends in uh, thesaurus technology. And finally, probably uh, we do not do a a, a good enough job in promoting it, our office manages translation licenses. All of our translation licenses are free of charge, uh, and they are, it's in line with uh, our reuse uh, policy. We want people to reuse our information. Uh, when I say we probably can do a better job, we haven't had, year to date, now end of September, we've had over 40 requests for licenses, translation licenses in 2012. Uh, the most recent one just about a week or two weeks ago from someone here in Latvia who uh, obtained a license to translate uh, a document uh, into Latvian concerning social policy. There, there's a major trend going on in publishing, which I'm sure I don't need to exp explain to any of you. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the argument is always, is print dead or not? Uh, my personal belief and at the office is that print is not dead, it will never die, but the reality is it's declining rapidly. Over the last uh, three years, the actual uh, dissemination of uh, printed publications by us has declined annually in double digits. Very, very significant drop in uh, paper publications. It's driven by technology, but it's also driven by the financial crisis. Uh, the Secretary General of the Commission issued uh, a goal last year in 2011 to all Directorate Generals to reduce 
uh, paper publications by 25 percent. And in fact, the reality of the numbers for uh, 2011 uh, and the trend is continuing year to date 2012 is that the decline in paper dissemination has exceeded the goal of 25 percent. Uh, at the same time, everyone knows that especially younger uh, uh, users, they expect to receive their information, their publications uh, in electronic form on their iPads, on their uh, e-readers, uh, uh, on their iPhone electronic devices. So those two trends are w is what is really driving uh, a key uh, paradigm shift in, in the publishing industry. At the publications office, we've Base, we're basing our future strategy uh, uh, to take advantage of this trend, and we actually think that paradoxically, this future electronic publishing age could benefit uh, multilingualism. Why? Because we're trying to create content upstream, working much more closely with our authors, the institutions and the bodies, by creating the, concept, uh, the content in a format agnostic way. We're telling our authors, don't think do you want this to appear as a pamphlet, as a book? Uh, uh, just create the content, and we will structure it in a very standardized way using uh, extendable markup language. So all of our future publications uh, are based on XML. By having this very standardized structure of the content, it allows us to then decide much farther down the value chain at the moment when you want to disseminate do you need a paper uh, version? Do you want it only to be available on your website? Do you want to charge it to a USB key because you want to have a promotional gadget at some event or on a CD? Uh, or do you want to have it downloadable in, uh, in an EPUB format, which is becoming the standard in the industry? And so by doing that, you are able to make tremendous economic savings and re because you're reusing the original creation of the content multiple times, whereas today or historically, I'll give you a concrete example. Today, we have a specific contract at the publications office, which we just launched about a month ago, uh, to go back to the institution saying, because they've been coming to us, we have this great document that we have in paper, and it continues to be highly read. Can we convert it to EPUB? So we created a contract to convert it to EPUB, but that conversion process is far more costly than it had we originally created the content in XML, and then simply we could have been on the fly done a print run or on the fly loaded into an EPUB format. So that shows where the economics really play a big role in all of this. And finally, we're trying to convince all of our uh, uh, authoring institutions not to, just like the industrial world, don't plan your production run. Do print on demand. Have the content in a form where it's easily printed quickly on demand, but the costs, the, the, the annual costs of a large print run and then storing that in a warehouse and then responding to, the, uh, to, to a, a, a demand are becoming prohibitive. In this way, we think that in the future, it's hard to say how quickly we'll be able to achieve that. I take an example. A user in any European country who is interested in nanotechnologies, we want to build at the publications office uh, a common portal whereby when he types in the word he's looking for something on nanotechnologies, he will first of all immediately f find a menu where he can get information on all the legislation all the directives that have been concerning nanotechnology. He may immediately find information about all the EU-funded research uh, projects and programs on nanotechnologies, um, and he will find information on certain policy aspects, maybe from DG uh, consumer uh, and health, uh, about what are the constraints in terms of health or other consumer issues on nanotechnologies. So that as opposed to going and searching in silos for different information, it's a one point point of access. In addition to that, just a few months ago, our Interinstitutional Management Board has given us the lead role of developing the future linked open data portal of the European Union. 
uh, which initially would be a linked open data portal among all the DGs of the Commission, but we want to extend it as we are an interinstitutional agency and we have the support of the board. We, we want to link it to the Parliament, uh, the Council, uh, the Court of Justice, all the other bodies. So in conclusion, um, I don't think I've given you the answers to how technology can, uh, uh, concrete answers, because I'm not a technologist, but we strongly believe that uh, the Publications Office, on behalf of all the institutions of the European Union, that we are moving in the direction of using digital and semantic technologies so that we can ensure the reuse and long-term archiving of content. So you save it and, you, and that gives really, that raises the image of having a trusted source of information because you know that information has been uh, archived correctly and that it can be reused in the future. And we think that that is uh, the publishing trend of the future. And, and I uh, encourage you as members of the technology industry in working with uh, uh, tools that can help uh, enable uh, uh, the publishing industry to achieve these goals of, of providing publications in multilingual languages. Thank you.